Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on another episode of the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results, and sometimes some other stuff too. Now, we all know that junk food is bad for us, but what about junk news and social media? These days, you gotta keep it clean. It's getting pretty nasty out there. The nightly news cycle of local crimes, endless stream of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram updates and feeds, celebrity gossip, reality TV shows, trendy clickbait articles, the list goes on and on. In this age of information overload, your life can be filled with irrelevant or unnecessary information in an instant that just kind of clouds your mind for the rest of the day. To help us simplify our lives at uh, at a very opportune time as we get this new year off to a fresh start. We're here with Mr. James Clear. James is a writer focused on habits, decision making, and continuous improvement. His work has appeared in the New York Times Entrepreneur Time and CBS This Morning, and we have a lot to catch up on since he was last on the show many years ago. But before we get to the interview, here is a review that just came in from Cleo the Leo. Cleo says, it works. It's very difficult for me to lose weight due to a medical condition, and I lost 10 pounds in six weeks. I already ate gluten-free, grass-fed, organic, minimal grains, so I think what made the biggest difference was intermittent fasting. That basically meant eating hard-boiled eggs two to three hours later than I was used to on most days. Definitely worth a try. Cleo the Leo. Well, congratulations on shedding those stubborn 10 pounds, Cleo. I know uh, if you've been trying for a while and doing a lot of the right things, it can be really frustrating. But, you know, fasting doesn't work for everyone, but it does work for me, or at least it, it's been working for me uh, for many years now, and I very much enjoy it. And so if you haven't tried fasting and you're listening and you think it might be worth trying out, I know James Clear has been fasting for, for many years now. We talked about that way back in the day, but just try pushing your breakfast a little bit later in the day. That's all it really takes. And if you feel good, you could push it all the way to lunch. And once you do, you've essentially got a 16-8 type fast, which a lot of bodybuilders use to uh, shed fat, but also, uh, I guess, protect against losing muscle at the same time. Um, there are a lot of hormonal benefits that I'm not going to get into right now. But, uh, but anyway, Cleo, also, dig the name. Fun fact, I'm half Leo. So if you are listening or watching, you enjoyed the wild diet or you've, you've learned something from this show, I'd love to hear about it. The easiest thing to do, best way to get in touch with me these days with all the crazy social media platforms, places you can comment and what have you. Uh, always go to fatburningman.com and uh, leave a comment or just reply to my email uh, on the email newsletter. And I try to read every single one of those and I reply to as many as I can. Or I even address them in my live streams on this show. Sometimes I even uh, wind up making guests of it. In fact, many years ago, that's how I first got in touch with, or, or more accurately, Denny Hemmingson of the Tim McGraw Band got in touch with me uh, because uh, he he and some of the bandmates had been listening to the show, had great results, and uh, then we got in touch, got to become great friends, record the Swamp Thing album together, and all sorts of stuff. So who knows what might come of you getting in touch, but um, I, you know, the longer Allison and I do this, the more we really appreciate uh, the people who follow what we do and, and, and uh, watch our work, because it's kind of self-selective. You folks tend to be very intelligent, inspired, and just overall good people. So um, yeah, don't be shy. Drop a line anytime. Go to fatburningman.com. Also, if you're interested in some of the other crazy stuff that we're up to right now, uh, like the virtual reality and 360 videos in particular, then be sure to go to ablejames.com to see the new 360 VR series we're calling Adventures with Abel. We've already uh, released uh, basically virtual tours uh, that you can watch on your phone, your computer, or even virtual reality goggles of um, Badlands National Park, uh, as well as Yellowstone, Grand Tetons, um, America's Stonehenge in New Hampshire, Seacoasts, uh, my favorite fishing spot, so many cool places. It's a, it's a bizarre and incredible immersive new technology. Um, it will be used for good and bad in the future, but we're trying to like get one step ahead of it and put out some hopefully educational and interesting uh, type 
uh, content and, and VR videos for you folks. So if you haven't checked it out, go to ablejames.com and give it a shot. It can be glitchy still, <laughs> but on most phones, you're able to get the augmented reality effect. So you, you really do feel like you're there in a way that regular video uh, just doesn't capture. And so if you'd like to support us, then be sure to go to fatburningman.com, check out the shop, uh, see if there's anything there like a fitness program, fat loss program, cooking classes uh, that you're interested in. Um, or go to wildsuperfoods.com for our new health supplements company, which is acting as the sponsor of this show and other content that we're putting out. Um, when you sign up for the ultimate daily bundle, the subscribe and save, then you get free access to our coaching community every month. And uh, I can get to know you that way, too. We, we uh, one of the reasons reasons we're, you know, putting wild superfoods out there and some of our educational programs is to help pay the bills, but also make sure that uh, we can keep making uh, the vast majority of our content like this show totally free so that there's no paywall between <laughs> people and the truth, which unfortunately is just kind of how it is these days a lot of the time. But anyway, um, this show will always be free and uh, we're going to do our best to keep it free of, of any outside corporate influence or sponsors and all of that, hopefully in perpetuity. So we appreciate um, everyone who has purchased. I know a lot of you have been listening to this show for a long time and have been, um, you know, wonderful supporters, supporters, some financially. So if you've purchased anything from us ever, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we could not do it without you. So one more time, that's wildsuperfoods.com or sign up for the newsletter at fatburningman.com, which is also free and has a bunch of goodies. All right, on to the show with Mr. James Clear. You're about to learn how to stop overdosing on celebrity gossip, the news, and low-quality information. The best way to get a good habit to stick, how our physical environment influences our behavior, that's a big one, how to handle haters on the internet more than ever, <laughs> and much more. All right, let's go hang out with James. All right, folks, James Clear is a writer focused on habits, decision-making, and continuous improvement. He's a regular speaker at Fortune 500 companies, and his work is utilized by teams in the NFL, NBA, and MLB. Welcome back to the show, good sir. Hey, it's great to talk to you, man. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So your new book is getting people on track in a time that everyone seems more scattered than ever. But um, <laughs> I noticed, I think it was on your your blog, your website, I was uh, just on there, and you had an article talking about uh, how you should stop overdosing on the news and low quality information. Talk about that a little bit. Seems like hmm. that is a problem yeah. these days. Well, I a couple of years ago, I came to this realization that uh, all of the best ideas I had come across or the ones that seem to stand the test of time and like were most useful in my life had come from books and not from the news. Yeah. And uh, wow. then I had this realization that the news is a TV show, mm -hmm. which sounds weird to frame it that way because we usually don't think about it like that. But right. the, the news is a media company and every day they put on a new episode. And the goal of that episode is to get as many eyeballs as possible. Mm -hmm. And so um, they put on the things that are most likely to elicit uh, eyeballs watching, which generally means driving fear or anxiety or sparking up some kind of emotion. Sometimes it's a positive one. Sometimes they have positive stories and, you know, like get you to feel joyful or happy or so on. But uh, most of the time it tends to have a, a negative tilt um, because that's what drives behavior. But um, the other insight that I had while I was kind of wrestling with those same ideas is that by definition for something to be newsworthy, it must be an outlier because if yeah. it's normal everyday life, then it's not newsworthy. It's not notable. You know, like you're never going to see a news story that's like man eats chicken and salad for lunch today. Right. right. Like it's only a news story a year later when it's like man loses 100 pounds because that's, you know, that's the outcome or that's the surprising thing. Um, and so because of that, that we get into this, we're kind of boxed in this weird situation where we look to the news to be informed about what's going on in the world. But by definition, it's not most of what is going on in the world. It's the outlier events that we see. Mm -hmm. So then we start to overestimate how often those things are happening or how prevalent they are because we see them every day. 
But by definition, they're the thing that happens like 0.1% of the time. That's why it's newsworthy in the first place. Yeah. So uh, it's really easy to watch the news and feel like there are more rapes and murders and fires and so on than there are in daily life. Um, and so I, it's not that I don't want to know about those things at all. It's just that I want to have the proper perspective on them. And, uh, when I realized that and that it was a TV show and that the most useful and robust and, uh, lasting ideas that I had come across were from books, I decided to shift my information consumption, shift my information diet from one of, uh, short tidbits of news to one, uh, more of books mm -hmm. And the one solution that I came up with, I haven't heard uh, anybody else talk about for um, for staying informed, for remaining, because that that's the next thing people often say is like, well, what about just being a good citizen? What about you know like staying up to date on things? Right. And one response to that is what I just said about the outlier idea that actually, you, if you feel like you're being up to date, but you're actually being up to date on a very small portion of life and not what's mostly happening. But the uh, the second piece is. At the end of each month, I have a reminder to go to Wikipedia and type into the search bar month and year. So like August 2018. And when you do that, uh, so you do that on like, say, September 1st, it'll pull up the most prevalent or most important stories from the last month. And what ends up happening is the list is almost never longer than like 10 items. It's right. like five to 10 things. And yeah. this is for worldwide news that was worthy of a Wikipedia entry. And you immediately cut out all of the stuff that was like a part of the 48 hour news cycle that yeah. just was you thought it was super important, but actually the market just dropped three percent. and It doesn't matter at all because next week it's back up three percent and we're back to where we were. Right. And you just eliminate all of that noise and only see the relevant things um, that at least have stood the test of a month. You know, like if it's not if it's not relevant three weeks after they run it, how important is it really? Right. Um, and so that's kind of it was all part of this larger perspective pursuit of lasting and applicable knowledge. I love that because that's exactly what we're not getting from, for the most part, social media and the internet these days. It, it's interesting because I think when we first uh, got to know each other a little bit, it was like the, the internet was, or um, searches and, and internet research was where you went to go deep. And now it seems it's where you go <laughs> to be as surfacy and 140. 40 character or less -y as possible. You know what I mean? Social media is an interesting place because if you, if you, in a sense, your social media followings or uh, the people you follow, it's kind of like you get to create your own little city, you yeah, know, like you totally. get to choose who the citizens are mm -hmm. and you need to be very careful about who you choose because that determines what ideas you get exposed to each day. Right. So does advertising though. At the same time, yes, intermingled true. with all of your friends and all the people you choose. That's a fair point. Uh, the You don't have total control, right? Advertising will interject itself in there a little bit as well. Um, but the, uh, the common quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, I think actually we could maybe shift that and say, like, you're the average of the ideas you spend the most time with. Yeah, I like and that. On social media, you get to choose to a certain degree what those ideas are. And so it can be really useful, but what I've realized is it's not the default. And it wasn't even the default for me. Like I had to spend dozens of hours curating my Twitter feed yeah. to make sure that I was following people who were like very high signal, very low noise, very high information density and like applicability and usefulness for daily life right. and not just like emotion and anger and raw, you know, whatever, like all the things that you stereotypically have associated with those 140 character bits of information. And like you said, the, the news is a TV show. Having been on a reality TV show, I can tell you that it's not news as much as it's a TV show. Like, uh, I was shocked because so many people watched the, the weight loss competition, ABC TV show that I was on. And I was even more shocked to find how many people were trying to be informed by it. Um, when it was so much, having been on that show, I can tell you it was like 90% show and like 10% actual stuff. And of that 10%, you saw almost none, you know, um, that actually reaches the viewership. So news obviously is not reality TV, but it's not too far off. I think we can agree at this point. So if you do want to be informed, uh, I, you know, I, I think that the Wikipedia, even though that obviously isn't perfect, either um 
strategy that you mentioned is so it, it's such a great example of what you can do today to use hopefully technology as a tool instead of something that's controlling you. I think you can do that uh, in, in many different ways. I mean, I talk about that a lot in the book that I just wrote about how to use technology to like uh, promote good habits rather mm -hmm. than like as the default that pulls you into things. But um, but it requires effort. It requires a little bit of strategy and thinking. Um, and the, the Wikipedia example is kind of like that news strategy. Imagine news programs don't work this way, but imagine if they only ran a news show when they had like a really meaningful event. You know, like, but that, that's not how it works. No. Instead, they have to go on every day at 5 p.m. And so because they're going on TV, they have to fill that space with something. And so then they got to find. So it literally is a show rather than, you know, whereas the Wikipedia entry is like we only write the entry when there's something worthy of writing. Yeah. Um, and so that it like helps you filter a little bit better. Um, but yeah. Also, the negativity bias is so very much at play whenever you're talking about media. Right. Um and and channels or or personalities or whatever um most of the ones at the top know that you get a lot more fire and juice from being divisive than you do from being good <laughs> that's important for people to know on the other end because i don't think it's widely acknowledged right the negativity bias specifically I don't I don't know if this is a true story or not, but I had heard the story about um, newspaper in Chicago during the Great Chicago Fire. And this is like late 1800s, I think. Um, and the that paper saying like half the city is burned uh, sold better than any paper ever before. Mm -hmm. And that was like the inciting event that taught journalists mm -hmm. and media that negativity is what sells. Right. And, uh, from there we kind of continued down this slippery slope of, uh, framing things in a more negative way, but really to be more accurate, um, what they're really trying to do is just frame things in the most emotional way. If you get mm -hmm. people to feel something, then the emotion, all behavior is emotionally driven at some level. Oftentimes our emotion, uh, it's like low level and we don't consciously feel it. Yeah. Um, like for example, you walk into a dark room, you, there's some tinge of emotion that gets you to flip the light switch on. You don't like the uncertainty of being in a dark room. Now we don't consciously think, Oh, I feel so worried and fearful and so on whenever we flip a light switch on, but the emotion is there as part of the driver and, uh, at a higher, more conscious level, the more emotion someone feels uh, about a news story or whatever, the more likely they are to not be able to pull their eyes away from the TV and continue to watch to figure out what's going to happen next. Yeah, it's I'm mean, just thinking of it now. It's the opposite of holistic, right? It's like what all of those different channels and things are doing is pulling us all these different directions. And so we're feeling more scattered than ever. But I think one of the things that's really uh, valuable about your book in particular is how you you kind of like break down habits and reactions in the process of what you go through uh, when you actually make a decision. So could you could you break that out a little bit for us? Um, because I can't remember the specific part of your book, but it's like three pieces. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. see. I, I so, made a little note someplace. <laughs> you probably got so it. So there are, um, well, are you referring to the identity process outcomes or to the four stages of the loop, cue, craving, response, reward? The latter, but let's also talk okay. about identity later. Okay, so we can come back to identity because it, it ties in with this this stage. But um, so I like to divide habits into four stages: uh, cue, craving, response, and reward. And I think that by doing it that way, by dividing a habit into those four steps, we can more precisely understand what a habit is, what gets it to start, why it sticks, and then how we can adjust it. So. Uh, before any habit, there's some kind of cue. There's some kind of prompt. So I'll just go with the example I just mentioned. You walk into a dark room, the room is dark. That's the cue. In this case, it's a visual cue, mm -hmm. but some, it could be any of the senses. It could be auditory or smell or touch or so on. But um, visual cue, the room is dark. Next, there's some type of interpretation of the cue. There's a prediction that your brain makes about what to do next. And that's what I call the craving. So Dark room is the cue prediction. I would like to be able to see. I'd like to reduce the uncertainty of being in a dark room. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to know what's here and so on. That prediction, that craving is what motivates you to act. Um, it's the image that it creates in your head. And I'll give another uh, food-related example in a second. So craving, I want to be able to see. 
response, I flip on the light switch, reward, I'm the room is lit, I'm able to see. I reduce the uncertainty of being in a dark room. And that is one of the purposes of um, any reward is to resolve the craving, the desire that came before the action. And so I think it's really instructive to have those two. It's kind of like every habit is sandwiched by an interpretation, by a prediction Mm -hmm. and an outcome that says, was your prediction right or was it wrong? And when it's right, we have a reason to repeat it again in the future. And when it's wrong, we have a reason to update our prediction the next time around. Mm -hmm. Um, And this can help explain what I think are a couple key questions about habits. One, for example, is how come two different people can look at the same cue and have a different response? Right. So, for example, one person walks into the kitchen and sees a pack of cigarettes on the counter and they immediately interpret that cue as, oh, I should smoke. I have a nicotine craving. I am feeling anxious. It'll help resolve my call, call my nerves, resolve my stress and so on. So they have this craving for cigarettes and then pick one up and smoke it. Another person who's not a smoker might walk in, see the pack of cigarettes on the counter, and it means nothing to them. It's just a neutral. It's like a little icon in their right. environment. They see yeah. it and they don't get any craving at all. And, um, it's the interpretation of the cue that prompts the response. And so by having that second stage there, we can more accurately understand why two people might act differently in the same circumstance. And then the second thing that it does is it explains why the same person like me would respond differently to the same cue. So for example, if I wake up and I walk into the kitchen and I see a loaf of bread, I might say, or my, I might see that cue and think, oh, I need to make some toast, you know, like I'm, I want to make breakfast. Mm-hmm. And so I take out a piece of bread and throw it in the toaster and make it and go eat it and so on. But we could just as easily imagine that 10 minutes later, I walk into the kitchen and I see the same cue. I see the loaf of bread, but now I'm, my stomach's full. And I think I interpret it differently. I think, oh, mm-hmm. I don't want to eat anything. I'm full. I just had breakfast. And so uh, understanding that all behavior is prediction driven uh, it has a craving preceding it helps under, helps you understand how you interpret cues and why you respond differently in different circumstances. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, anyway, those four stages, cue, craving, response, reward, I think is a good way to divide up a habit and what it is. But what we think we want isn't always what we actually want, right? Like when, whether you're talking about a craving or a reward, like it's messy, it's not perfect. Certainly. There are, uh, first of all, in many cases, there are competing cravings. Um, So let's say, for example, that you want to go for a run at 6 a.m. in the park. 6 a.m. rolls around and you have one urge, which is to stay in bed because it's warm and feels nice and you're tired and so on. And then but you agreed to meet your friend at 6 a.m. at the park. So you have a second urge, which is I don't want to be a jerk and leave my friend there. And so these two cravings are competing against each other, and one of them wins out. Um, in this case, let's say you don't want to be a bad friend, so that gets you out of bed, and you decide to, you know, not stay warm and huddled up under the blankets. But um, so those, so yes, it can be messy. And then the other thing is sometimes we think like on the surface, we think we want one thing, Mm -hmm. but actually we're looking to satisfy like a much deeper or more primal drive. Like, um, you might think, Oh, I can't stop checking Instagram. But what you really want is not to check Instagram. What you really want is to not feel bored or Mm -hmm. to feel entertained Mm -hmm. or to change your state. And so there's kind of like a deeper layer underneath that that you're actually looking to address. And the modern manifestation of that is just checking Instagram. (laughs) How do you know when you found, when you need to find that deeper level or when you found it? Well, I don't know if you ever need, uh, to, Oh, how do you know when you're there? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. But also it's like, if people are addicted to checking Instagram, it's important that they know that it's not Instagram they're addicted to is what I'm also saying. Right. So, um, this will get a little technical and if you want to cut this, feel free, but, um, no, go so, deep. The, so the, the lowest level for, I think pretty much any organism is this axis of defending versus discovering. So for any living being, the first thing is you need to defend your, your life, your survival. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to stay safe, but once you stay safe, there is a reward or potential reward in discovering, in searching your environment. 
all organisms do this. Even plants will reach toward the sun or mm-hmm. reach out to try to catch more rain. Um, so they're in that sense, they're exploring their environment. They're reaching into the unknown, um, what is outside of their current uh, leaf to try to get more nutrients or resources or so on. So humans have this same axis where we come into the world and we don't know much about it at all. And as we go through life, we try to explore more widely and more widely. Now, there are risks associated with that. There are risks out in the unknown, but there are also rewards in the unknown. And so that's what gets us to to search. And whenever you get into an environment where you feel like too uncertain, you usually recoil back a little bit. Like you go to a networking event and you don't know anybody except your one friend. And then you just stay right by them while you're there, because that's the most known thing in this very uncertain environment. But as you become more and more familiar with whatever environment you're in, you start to reach out a little bit. And the reason you do that is to capture rewards. And the reason we want rewards is because they provide us with energy uh, for more survival, for better survival. They provide Mm -hmm. us with resources for making our way through the world more effectively. All right. So that's the base layer. Then the second layer on top of that are some of these more modern, uh, well, not modern manifestations, but I'll, I'll call them like primal drives. So like the desire to be entertained or to not be bored. Well, that's on the discover side of the axis. Mm -hmm. That's part of, we, we like evolve to have this curiosity because organisms that have curiosity will discover more and thus come across more rewards and so on. And one of the ways that has manifested itself is just with this urge to be curious and look around and be entertained and like not want to be bored because organisms that are fine with being bored, that are fine with the same state, spend too much time on that defend part of the axis Mm. and don't discover enough rewards. So that's one example of a primal drive for the urge to not feel bored and to feel entertained. And that comes out of that axis. And then the third layer on top of that is the modern manifestation of checking Instagram or going to YouTube or whatever. And that's just that's just a consequence of our modern world that will change in 50 years or 100 years. It'll be something else, but Mm -hmm. it'll be trying to satisfy that same primal drive that lays on top of this ultimate desire or balance to defend and to discover. But our immediate behavior is often at odds with that reward, with the true reward we crave, right? How do you reconcile those things? Uh, so what do you mean? Give me like a little better example. So, uh, well, I think al- alcohol is a good example because it's almost always a bad decision. <laughs> so um, why does an alcoholic crave alcohol? It's not often the vodka and the taste, right? It's not the alcohol itself itself. It's something much deeper than that. And uh, so the immediate behavior might be to, for that state change that you mentioned before, might be to to numb pain, run away, from whatever, whatever it is. But sure. it is ultimately not serving them in the end. Even though they're after a reward, they kind of get it, but they get a lot of other things too and usually regret it. So I guess a, a true reward would be something that you don't regret right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Yeah. It's a great question. All right. So I think there are two things going on here, so I'm going to separate them and then answer both. So the first thing is, uh, addiction, which I would think, uh, in my mind, addiction is somewhat of a special case. Um, and then there are just bad habits, which also fall into the same category. You know, like you don't have to be an alcoholic to feel like, well, I kind of regret drinking on the weekend. You know, I wish I hadn't done that. So, um, for addiction, one of the definitions of addiction is you continue to repeat a behavior despite negative consequences. So you know that it doesn't serve you, you know, it's not a good outcome, Mm -hmm. but you still can't stop yourself from doing it. You still get the craving that drives you to, to take that action. And these four stages that I mentioned just a few moments ago, cue, craving, response, and reward, they form a feedback loop. And so when you, when you go through them and then you get an outcome, if that outcome is positive, then you're like, okay, my prediction was good. My craving was good. I should do that again next time. But with addiction, you go through those four stages and you get to the end of the feedback loop and the outcome is negative. But some, for some reason, the brain, the loop, the feedback loop in the brain is kind of like broken and you still think the next time I should do it again, Mm -hmm. even though 
the consequences is negative. And uh, there are a variety of uh, theories on why that's occurring. I actually, although I feel like I know a lot about habits, I don't consider myself an expert on addiction specifically. Sure. And there's kind of a, there, there are a lot of insights that are coming out now biologically, neurologically. Uh, there are some really interesting new treatments that are going on with magnetic resonance, some of them pharmaceutical. I, I think my, where I currently feel like that stands is we're on the cusp of learning some interesting things, but we don't know yet. Okay. Um, but I do think that that feedback loop is, uh, is somewhat broken there. Mm -hmm. But then we have the second thing, and I think this is actually widely applicable to anyone um, and, uh, and fits in well with what we're talking about, which is your question that, well, if something is actually rewarding, it would be rewarding in the long run, right? Like it would actually be good for you. And I think that this is, in a sense, we, we use words like good habits and bad habits, but uh, really all habits are, maybe a better word would be like effective habits or ineffective habits. And so like hab a, a bad habit still serves you in some way. It's effective at getting you something in the moment. But I still am fine with using those words, good and bad, because I think the key distinction is what you just hinted at, that pretty much all behaviors produce multiple outcomes across time. And for bad habits, it's often the case that the immediate outcome is favorable. Like if you eat a donut right now, the immediate outcome is it's sugary, it's tasty, yum. it's sweet, it's enjoyable. Yeah, the immediate outcome is yum. Um, that's how it's serving you. But the ultimate outcome, if you continue to repeat that habit for a week or a month or a year, is unfavorable. Yeah. And so I think that we can define bad habits as being unfavorable in their ultimate outcome. Whereas good habits, in many cases, the immediate outcome is actually a little unfavorable. Like going to the gym requires some sacrifice. You sweat. It takes effort and energy. But the ultimate outcome, if you repeat that habit for a week or a month or a year, is favorable. And so I think that that's a good way to distinguish what is good and what is bad. But the reason that we – and this this is where looking at bad habits can actually be instructive for building good ones, which is how can we form bad habits so readily? If those mm -hmm. things don't uh, serve us in the long run, why do we so easily form them? Why do we so badly want a donut or to watch more Netflix or whatever? And the answer is the human brain is wired to prioritize immediate rewards. I mean we spent – many, many thousands of years in an environment that scientists would refer to as an immediate return environment, right? Uh, an environment where it benefited us to take our immediate or very near term needs into account. Like, where am I getting the next meal from? Where's the water source? There's a storm on the horizon. I need to take shelter. Uh, there's a lion there. I need to make sure I'm a safe distance away. And the consequence of evolving in an immediate return environment is you heavily prioritize immediate rewards and you discount delayed rewards because having an apple right now in the moment is more valuable than maybe having five apples in a week, but you don't know if somebody else is going to take them or they'll go rotten or whatever. And so the brain is wired that way to prioritize the immediate outcome. And because bad habits uh, we just mentioned are more likely to serve us in the near term, but hurt us in the long term, we find ourselves often sliding in to those things that provide immediate satisfaction. And I think that the ultimate lesson here, if we're going to try to take the reins and use this, this insight to build good habits rather than to break bad ones, is to say, well, what can we learn from that? And we can learn that bad habits form readily because they provide an immediate satisfaction. And one of the great ways to get a good habit to form readily or to make it more likely to stick is to try to find a way to make that habit satisfying in the moment so that you have a reason to repeat it while you're waiting for those delayed rewards to accumulate in the background. Mm -hmm. And you brought up too, because how could you not environment and how important that is when it comes to habits, especially the things that we're doing um, unconsciously or non-consciously non or unconsciously or whatever. Um, and, and it just occurred to me that historically, if you're thinking about our ancestors, they would have an opportunity to recreate their own habits very often because they were moving all the time. They were nomadic. And for my wife and I, we, we are more nomadic than, than most. And every time we move, we use it as an opportunity to set up um, to cleave the old b bad habits, whatever that means, and hopefully help install new ones. And so I'm just kind of thinking about how we're kind of um, we're sucked into 
whatever habit we're in in our environment, usually a morning routine is a great example or after you get home from work, right? We just, we, we do the same thing without even thinking about it. Yet, if we travel to our friend's house or if we go somewhere else, all of a sudden it's a blank slate. Like, what do I do this morning? I'm not sure what to do. But that's a good example of how every day could look where it's like you could, in fact, start with a blank slate and install your best habits tomorrow if you really want to. But we don't feel like that, right? Well, you can – so you raise an interesting point, a good one, which is that um, – all habits are in a, at a certain level, they're about associations. They're about associating a solution, uh, something that solves a recurring problem in your life with a particular context. So like take the habit of tying your shoes. So whenever you put a shoe on your foot and the shoelace is untied, that's like a situation that repeats itself each morning. You see that now it doesn't always look exactly the same. Sometimes you put on a slightly different shoe or, you know, the shoelaces are a different color or whatever, but your brain maps what it has remembered, the habit it has built onto that similar context. And then you just pull that like mental shortcut out and you tie your shoes without thinking about it. You perform the habit whenever the context is similar. But your point about switching to a new context, you know, being nomadic or changing uh, environment or being on the road and traveling for work, whenever the context changes, it's harder to build habits because – or it's harder to, to stick with your old habits because now you don't have the same cues, right, the same things firing that old script. But the good news is it's easier to build new ones because you're not looking, you aren't trying to like overcome your behavioral biases, you know, like you aren't trying to overcome these associations you already have built in. And so one, one solution, this is what you mentioned or what you've lived out a little bit, like being nomadic ish, uh, and moving to a new place and using that as a way to build a new habit. But you can also do this in a smaller way, even if you live in the same environment. So, you know, one solution is to redesign a little bit of your room. So like take one example, we talked about the news earlier. Um, a lot of people feel like they watch too much TV or too much screen time on Netflix or whatever. But walk into any living room. Where do all the couches and chairs face? Right. They all face the TV. So it's like, what is this room designed to get you to do? It's the most obvious and easiest association to make in that environment. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to do something different, like if you say, I want to build the habit of journaling for 20 minutes after work each day. And then you come home and you sit on your couch where you usually watch Netflix for an hour you might not consciously be thinking of it, but you're fighting that internal association with this is where my TV habit happens. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can either make that easier by changing the environment. So put the TV inside a wall unit or a cabinet, take it off the wall and put it in the closet. If you want to be really extreme about it, turn the chair away from the TV. So it's not facing it and so on. Or you can find a new environment where you don't have current habits built or associated with that yet mm -hmm. and build your new habit there. So you could say, after I leave work, I'm going to go to this coffee shop across the street that I never go to, but now it's going to become the journaling coffee shop and I'll go in there. I'll turn my phone off when I walk in and this is where I journal for 20 minutes. And now after two weeks or a month or a little while, it, it becomes associated with that context. Journaling is the thing that happens there. And so um, that's a powerful way to use this idea of a new environment as a clean slate, as a blank slate for building a, a new habit. And I can really vouch for that. I think I, I learned that most in college when I was kind of speeding through and I had to study. And when I had to study, I really needed to study well and effectively. It had to happen. So um, there were these little areas that I would set up at different places even in different libraries where I'd study one thing in one spot and I'd study another thing like like I'd read in one spot and I'd write in another spot for example I'd, I'd get specific with it and it really helped um and and even if you go one level deeper there was one um kind of like acoustic laid back guitar album that I was listening to at the time that does not have lyrics it's really important especially if you're doing anything involving words but i would put on that particular album every time and as soon as i had my headphones on i was in that spot it's like boom i can go as long as i need to i know exactly what i'm needing needing to do i'm not being distracted at all and uh, man is that effective how can people do that in their normal out of college lives. I know you mentioned in the book, there are kind of like the higher budget or higher opportunity ways to do it. And then there's just, even if you lived in a cramped little space, you can do it too. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, those are great examples. I One of the examples I share in the book, this guy, Ed Lattimore, he did something similar. Where he'll, he'll listen to music that has no words, just acoustic, um, whenever he's writing. But he started to realize that he did it for like a couple months. And then he one time he put his headphones on and just started writing, but he forgot to press play. Yeah, and totally. it was like the action of putting the headphones on conditioned him to get into this writing mind. And um, you can utilize I call these motivation rituals. It's like a ritual that you do that precedes the action you do in the same place, the same way. Every time I was I, I was an athlete. That's my background. I played baseball through college. And I would do that whenever we had a game. I would do, do the, literally the exact same warm up, exact same stretches for the same amount of time, same number of throws. And the key for baseball in particular, there's so many games that coaches are always saying, like, you got to find a way to be motivated today. You got to find a way to be up and ready. Yeah. And there are just going to be days where you don't feel motivated. But if you can rely on your ritual, then it's kind of like a, a switch is being flipped Um, and it's like, oh, you know, like it's time to get, it's game time, right? It's time to go. And so you were kind of doing that with your study habits by having that specific location and practice and so on. And, uh, we've already given some examples of doing that with like a totally new environment, like the coffee shop or something like that. Mm -hmm. But you can also do it within the same environment. Like if you want to build, say a reading habit, And again, using this example of trying to sit on your couch, but you're kind of naturally pulled toward watching TV or YouTube or whatever, get a different chair and put that in the corner of the room. And that becomes the reading chair. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that you do, and this it's incredibly important for the beginning, especially, you know, the first like 30 times, say you sit down, you only read in that chair. And soon it's, it'll be much easier to get into that pattern because that's the only thing that happens there. Um, and so little things like that can help condition yourself, condition your mind to get into the right zone at the right time. And the two, is it the two minute rule that could come in handy there as well? If you want to build that habit. I, so this is what I think is one of the best places to start for someone who's looking to build a new habit. This is probably like one of the first things I would recommend. So the two minute rule, it's a simple idea. You just take whatever habit you're trying to build. So read 30 books a year or do yoga five days a week and you scale it down to just the first two minutes. So read 30 books a year becomes read one page or do yoga five days a week becomes take out my yoga mat. And sometimes that sounds like a little silly to people because they're like, well, I, you know, I know the real thing is I want to do yoga. I'm not just looking to take my yoga mat out. That's not going to get me in shape. But the key insight that people often overlook is that a habit must be established before it can be improved. You need to master the art of showing up Mm -hmm. before you can figure out how to expand and do it better. And we often overlook that. Like people, people have heard things like, oh, you should start small or baby steps or whatever. But even when you know that, it's still really easy to start too big. And people will do things like, you know, okay, I want to go for a run three days a week, but I know I should start small, so only run for 15 minutes. But even that's like way bigger than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like put your running shoes on and get out the door. And if you do anything else, it's just extra. And the reason that that's so crucial is it allows you to master the art of showing up. Mm -hmm. And if you master the art of showing up and become the type of person who does it each day, then you have a lot of options for expanding and improving from there. Yeah, the rest is gravy. It and the, it's so bizarre, but the hardest part is putting on your your sneakers or whatever and lacing them up. It's not running. Once you're running, it's like I remember when I was doing a bunch of marathons. It's like the first mile, I'm like, ugh, I feel terrible. <laughs> this is never going to work out. And then the second mile, ugh, this is, I don't know about this. And then third mile, it's like, oh. I'm, kind of loosening up things are feeling good and then all of a sudden your mile 16 or whatever things suck again <laughs> you know you have to work through it and then things are cool again but it's it's this process you're never there but you always have to kind of trick yourself um in in order to persevere and one thing um that i it's it's an exercise that uh, a recent guest spoke about that is so powerful. It's not imagining yourself all covered in sweat and victorious at the end, which can be helpful in its own way. It's, it's imagining you at your lowest, that moment in your workout or in your challenge or in your performance or whatever it is, when you, you know it's going to come. It's, it's addressing that moment and, and visualizing yourself um, coming out of it victorious in your own way coming out of the lowest part it's it's 
going to that place in your mind and trying to imagine what you're going to do then when it definitely comes. And that, man, has that been helpful for me since I started? <laughs> really powerful stuff. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I think there's something about just focusing on mastering the decisive moment that comes at the beginning of the behavior mm -hmm. that allows you to, to show up, you know, like you mentioned, you know, the beginning of the marathon is the hardest part and so on. Um, I've seen that in a couple different areas. Like for me, I, I go to the gym and work out four or five days a week, but the real key that determines all that is if I change in my workout clothes. If I change it to my workout clothes, everything else is going to happen. The next two hours already decided. And si something similar happens each morning where I sit down in my office and either it's like either I open up Evernote and I start working on the next article I'm going to write or I go to ESPN and I check the latest sports news. Yeah. And whatever happens in the first hour of the day is really determined by what happens in that first minute. Isn't that and, interesting? And um, then it cascades, so right? Yeah, it's really about mastering that decisive moment, that little fork in the road. And yeah. if you can do that, then the next chunk of time kind of takes care of itself. And when you realize that, I think it's a little bit insightful because it, it starts to show you that most people probably have maybe five or ten of those decisive moments throughout their day, mm -hmm. these little forks in the road that determine the next chunk of time. And if you can just pour your energy and your strategy into mastering those – the rest of the day kind of takes takes care of itself. Yeah. And so there's really not that much to figure out if you can just master those key moments. It's kind of like a form of mental judo or judo yeah. for habits. It's like apply the pressure at the right moment and the rest of it just falls in place. Yeah. And it, it's, it's fascinating how well that can work. I want to make work. I can't believe we're already up against time, but the Diderot effect uh, it kind of, it goes in the same direction along the same point where basically the idea is you obtain a new possession and then that creates a spiral of consumption. And what occurred to me is, is that during your moment, do I um, write my newest article or do I read ESPN and check the, the latest scores? It's, it's a, uh, do I create or do I consume here? Right. Mm -hmm. That's, what we're often faced with. That's what I'm faced with day after day. And you're right. Like once we get into that, uh, kind of phase of consumption, it just keeps going. And then your whole day is lost. It's kind of the same effect, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's true about a lot of behaviors, you know, I mean, the b behaviors and habits often come in bundles. You, go to the bathroom and that reminds you to wash your hands and that reminds you that the towels are dirty and you need to do the laundry and that reminds you that you need to pick up detergent from the store and mm -hmm. on and on and on, right? So there's kind of this like chain of behaviors that happens. And uh, the key insight that I have in that section of the book where we talk about the Diderot effect and this kind of like spiral of behaviors is that you can make this work for you rather than against you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be something that's like out of your control. Uh, and one of the best strategies for that is what I call habit stacking. But uh, I first learned it from BJ Fogg, who's a professor at Stanford. He refers to it as like the tiny habits recipe. But the basic idea is that you take whatever habit you're trying to build and you stack it on top of a current habit. So if you want to build a habit of meditation and you make a cup of coffee each morning, you could say something like, after I make my morning cup of coffee, I will meditate for 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to build the habit of journaling, like I mentioned earlier, you could say, after I leave the office for work, I will walk across the street to the coffee shop and journal for two minutes or something like that. And by having that very clear stack, you essentially create the Diderot effect for yourself. You mm -hmm. create this chain of where am I going to direct the momentum of my next action and how can I get that working for me and reminding me to build good habits rather than just kind of like taking a hold of me and seeing where it goes. And it is, it, it's really about, um, setting it up and then knocking it down is the way that I think of it in the morning. Oftentimes I'll take this tiny little notepad here, which you can see on the video version, tiny. Those are all the things that I'm going to do that day. I write it down and I kind of like visualize it. And I often put the same little things in the same spot, like my Qigong and meditation practice goes to the top right. And so like I set it up in the morning and then all day long I'm scratching it off. Occasionally I'll write a little extra bonus thing on there, but I get to scratch it off all day long. And it's funny, like talk about a, a mental trick. That is so silly. That's elementary school, right? But no, this is, this is what I've done like 
every single day for the past 10 plus years. And it is little things like that. Those little mental tricks on yourself. Um, don't think that you're better than them. Right, James? <laughs> well, it's remarkable how often we overlook strategies like that because we think everybody knows it. But mm -hmm. everybody knows this is very different than everybody does this. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Like there's all kinds of common sense that people are like, yeah, of course. But then you look at their behavior and they don't do it consistently at all. Mm -hmm. And that little action that you just described of creating this list. So you have a very clear implementation intention is what the psychology research would call it. A very clear plan for implementing what you're going to do throughout the day. And then uh, as you cross that off, what you get is like a visual measurement of your progress. You get a you build up momentum with each thing that you cross off. It feels good, feels satisfying the moment. And you feel like, man, I'm building towards a productive day. And uh, so it's a really effective strategy that will work for pretty much anybody. I mean, this is one of the reasons I log my workouts. It fe it's mm -hmm. a small thing, but it feels good to put another workout in the books and to write down what sets and reps I did. And it's there's a small sense of accomplishment that comes with that. And that's enough uh, in addition to the other benefits to get me to feel like, hey, I should show up again tomorrow and do this again. Yeah. And it's interesting. Almost always the first things to cross off are the hardest ones. And then after that, it's just like zip, 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 zip. It's easy. It's momentum. Um, geez, there, there are so many more things that I want to talk about with you. We'll just have to have you back on the show for sure. But like one more quick one. Um, how do you handle uh, what's a habit to handle? haters that come up more than ever for normal people today who are just trying to exist online? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know that it's a habit as much as it is gaining perspective on this thing, but like I, thankfully I'm very fortunate. I have a lot of people who really love my work and have been very supportive. And, uh, I try to remind myself that there are far more of them than, uh, of the haters and negative comments. But, um, first of all, I try to divide it into two categories. So the first category is, is this useful criticism? Like, is it actually constructive criticism? In yeah. which case I should be open-minded about that. Sure. The risk I, uh, I just did this the other day. I just shared a, a message on Twitter that said, if you're familiar with my work at all, even if only a little bit, feel free to answer any of the following questions. And it was like, when do you feel like I just don't get it? Or what topics do you wish I would cover that I don't? What's your biggest criticism of my work? And so on. And a few people responded and said things like, oh, you're so brave or, you know, like, I'm, that's really courageous to ask this or ask for public feedback or yeah, ask cool. for people to criticize your work. Um, which is nice of them to say, but honestly, I don't think that's actually true at all. It's way more upside than it is risk. The ups, the, the risk is you don't get feedback and you repeat the same stupid mistakes over and over again. <laughs> yeah, totally. The upside is I get to hear what I'm doing wrong once and maybe that's a little bit painful, but then I can address it. Then I can learn from it. Yeah. So first you need to have some distinction there because I think sometimes people just shut off and say, everybody's a troll. Everybody's a hater. Anybody who criticizes me, is not useful. Negative and that's, bias, that's right? dangerous <laughs> in its own right. Yeah. Um, but then there's the second category where it really is not effective. Um, it's, it is just, you know, people who are, I don't know if they're mad at their own life or upset for or a certain reason. At this or point. I, I just dismiss those as bots. Yeah, I, so many of them are anonymous. They're not even, you know, they don't even have a, a pay a face or a profile or an image or something. Um, and early on, maybe I would have cared more about that, but now I am able to separate myself from it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing is most of those people, even if they are a real person criticizing, they don't, have the full context. They don't know, like, let's say for example, that I write an article and someone isn't happy with the story I used or the example that I gave. Yeah. What they don't know is that I spent 10 hours searching for other examples and that was the best one that I could find to illustrate the point. And if they knew all the work that went into it, maybe they would view it very differently, but they don't have that context. And so I, um, I try to view their comments in the frame of like what context do they have to say this. And if I can put myself in their shoes, then maybe I can get something out of it. But mostly I can just dismiss it easily because I'm like, oh, they, you know, they're, they're missing literally like 80% of the picture. And so that makes this not a useful piece of criticism. Yeah. Well, we're, we're just about out of time, but I want to say, James, I've always appreciated going to your website and your work because it's so clean. There's not a whole bunch of like 
pop-ups and ads and all sorts of crap coming at you. It's, uh, it's very much intentional. You can tell that you practice what you preach, at least the best you can. Um, and you also don't claim to be the guru, which is very much appreciated. Um, so tell, tell folks before we go a little bit more about where they can find your new book, Atomic Habits, as well as your website and your work. Yeah, thanks, man. I'm glad you, you're enjoying the work in the book. Um, so just generally for my work, jamesclear.com, uh, and you feel free to click on the articles, and I have them organized by category so you can poke around and see what's interesting to you. Social media links and stuff are on there as well. But uh, specifically for the book, it's called Atomic Habits, an easy and proven way to build good habits and break bad ones, and you can find that at atomichabits.com. And on that page, there are also like some bonus guides, like a guide on how to apply the ideas to business, how to apply the ideas to parenting. Uh, there's a template for tracking your habits and some other stuff as well. But anyway, all of that is at atomichabits.com. Right on. Well, James, thank you so very much for coming on the show. I'm sure we'll have you on it again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Abel. Hey there, listener. Thanks so much for listening to the very end of this episode. As a special bonus, I'm including a new original song that I made up just for you live on the spot as part of my new improv music video series. I hope you like it. You can check out hundreds of these original songs and more for free at ablejames.com. Here we go.
This episode is brought to you by Wild Superfoods. Big news. After three plus years of nonstop tasting and testing, our brand new real food health supplements from Wild Superfoods are finally ready for you. Now, what does wild mean anyway? Well, we work with the laws of nature, not against them. We avoid anything artificial, genetically modified, or overly processed. Whether you need real food nutrition from fruits, veggies, and stress-fighting adaptogens in future greens, vitamins from vitamin D stack, balanced omegas in mega omegas, or immune-boosting probiotics in probiotic spheres, we have got you covered. Our shelf-stable nutraceuticals are of uncompromising quality, and they're convenient options for traveling, camping, emergency and disaster preparedness, as well as daily supplementation for optimal health. At Wild Superfoods, each of our products is lab-tested for purity and potency and formulated according to the latest cutting-edge developments in research, science, and medicine. Guaranteed nutrition no matter where you are. That's our promise to you, and we look forward to hearing how you like Wild Superfoods. And as a listener of Fat Burning Man, you can save over 80 bucks on a one-time purchase or save over $128 when you select subscribe and save. On top of that, you'll get free access to our coaching and meal planning community, the Fat Burning Tribe, which is normally $27 a month. All you have to do is head on over to Wild Superfoods. Dot com. All you have to do, type it in right now into that menu bar on your phone, tablet, computer, or anything else, VR goggles you might be using right now. Just check out wildsuperfoods.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you there. Well, hey there, listener. This is Abel one more time, and I just want to say thank you for listening to this episode of the Fat Burning Man Show. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever you might be listening to or watching this show right now. And if you have a second, please leave me a quick review for the Fat Burning Man Show. I read every single one of them, and every time you leave a review, it gives us a little boost in the rankings, and that helps other people find this show. And if you can think of someone else who might enjoy and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or a family member. And if they're like, what is this fat burning man thing? That's a really silly name. You could be like, you're right, but here's the deal. We've recorded over 250 episodes of the fat burning man show with thought leaders in health from all over the world. And so far we've won four awards hitting number one in health in more than eight countries internationally. We have more than 30 million downloads already, but we're just getting started. I can't believe any of this, by the way, and, and couldn't do any of this without you. So thanks once again. But here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode of the Fat Burning Man Show for free with zero outside advertisements, no outside sponsors, and no corporate overlords. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. I'll give you a, a second here just to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes, transcripts, and video and audio versions for all the past episodes of the Fat Burning Man Show for free. Better yet, enter your email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide so you can take your health into your own hands right now along with a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now. Enter your best email to get your free goodies with a bonus surprise straight to your inbox. This is Abel James signing off. Thank you so much for listening once again and have a great week.